Hello, this is Toner Quinn, editor of the Journal of Music, and this is the second episode of the Journal of Music podcast. My guest this week is Ilan Piper Paddy Keenan. We talk about his life as a musician, his time with the Bothy Band, and the journey he has been on since then. Here's the interview. Paddy, we're here in the National University of Ireland, Galway, mm-hmm. where you've just given a tremendous concert wow. as <laughs> part you. of the Arts in Action series mm-hmm. in the O'Donoghue Centre. And I thought there was a real connection in the room. I thought there was a real affection for your music from the audience. I'm just wondering how you felt about the concert. Well, I felt so, so relaxed. It was unbelievable, really, because I was a bit nervous about it, to be honest, in the beginning and up until a few days ago, because Gary and myself hadn't... Uh, played really like uh, concerts we'd, pl- we'd met you know many many times over the years and we had sessions and stuff like that but we never really um we never really did a professional say a concert together on this stage. is gary o'brien who accompanied gary you O'Brien, today. yeah and i felt so relaxed with him and i loved his choice of songs which were very different and uh no, and the audience, of course. The audience were very, 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 really relaxing audience. And they were great listeners. And there were a few pipers there, of course, in this, that added to it. And the repertoire you played today, it was a mix of tunes you would be associated with, like the mm. Steam Packet, Woman of the House, mm. and then repertoire you've written yourself. How do you go about putting together a set list for a concert? And that was very quickly done today, actually, because I wasn't quite sure what we were doing. So what I thought I thought was we should stick with, you know, the older stuff rather than... I mean, I'm not really in favour of a lot of the new, new... Uh, the trad, well, we call them new traditional tunes, if you like, or new tunes, but uh, some of them are brilliant, obviously. But I'm, I'm a person who stays a lot with the older, you know, uh, collection of tunes. And... I think that's possibly because, you know, we talk about styles and stuff like that, but for me it's a mood, you know, I, mood. I, I, expression of mood, music, using that to express yourself. And what are you trying to express? I don't know. When I was younger, well, I do, but years ago I didn't talk very much. I didn't, uh, and I suppose I used the music more or less as a language. And in fact, it's got me around the world as a language, you know. But... Um, I'll go back to the old and the new. Um, I thought it would be much easier if we if we did the tunes that we both knew, you know, know and have played before, and it would have been easier to, rather than doing something that was complicated and and possibly making a mess of it <laughs> without can, rehearsal, you know, and stuff. Can you tell me about how you started in music? Oh God, uh, I started. My brother played. Um, Johnny played the, the fiddle. My dad played most every instrument. But he was madly in love with pipes and uh, and flute. They were sorry, they were his main instruments. And uh, he uh, he taught us all the different instruments. I mean, Johnny the fiddle, and the banjo after that. And uh, I became somewhat the designated piper. <laughs> he he heard me. Pl- I played the whistle before him. My brother taught me the whistle when he was when I was about I don't know seven or eight. And. Um, then one day my dad was out fishing with Ted Fury. He came back and he heard me messing with his pipes. And whatever I was doing, he thought it was right. So he, he, I was the piper from there on. Had you had and any he, lessons on the pipes at that stage? No, only the only lessons, the only tutoring I'd have ever had was from my dad. And uh, in fact, he, he didn't even take me into the Piper's Club in Dublin, which is where most and everyone, I think, the pipers of the day and back then, Got their piping from the old Leo Rawson at the time, the Dublin Pipers Club. And when you picked mm. up the pipes as um, as a young boy, did you take the, to the instrument very, very quickly? Mm. Was there something natural about it? Did you find it easy almost? See, I'd seen my dad play them, of course, and uh, I had some little experience of the 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 blowing and the the, the setting them up and stuff like that, you know. But no, it it, it kind of came natural because I don't ever remember practicing. Really, honestly, I know it's, it's hard to believe, but I don't. And uh, my dad just taught me ways of like playing the tunes, technically technical stuff, and uh, he gave me all the tools, let's say, to later on uh, help me to express myself musically. And 
Was there a moment you realised this is something you wanted to do all the time? I loved them in the beginning. I did, really did. But um, when I was about 17, yeah, in 67, I went to London. I went to Liverpool and from there to London. And uh, these weren't great times to be in England with uh, troubles and stuff like that. So I, I wouldn't take the pipes out. No way. But I ran out of money and I tried to pawn them. And uh, I had all this story about the pipes. They belonged to the Honourable Garrick de Bruyne and, and, and the, the Irish and pipes. The guy didn't want to know. And I went down, I think, as far as two shillings because I would you know, want to get them back. But I needed some uh, money to, for, for food and stuff. But anyway, it didn't happen. I came outside and in frustration as a young lad, 17, I threw them into a bin. I, I would never have left them there, obviously, but my friend took them and he held them for something like three years. And during that time, there was a guy called Grattan Puxon. This is where I really missed out. He was a, he was a I think he might have been an MP at the time. But his wife was a singer, songwriter, guitarist and stuff. And she was uh, hanging out with people like around the Beatles and other musicians of note at the time. And she saw a great opportunity for not only popularising the instrument, which was dead there enough at the time, but uh, she saw this great opportunity not only to popularise the pipes, but to, uh, to uh, get me back on, on the instrument. Because I was playing guitar at this stage and busking the subways and singing and stuff. So she wrote to them and organised that I go introduce the Irish pipes to John Lennon. And I went to their house in Finchley uh, the night before. I think it would have been the White Album. What a miss. I stayed the night and I ran away next morning at seven in the morning to get away from it with my pipes. Oh, I was just too embarrassed. I was so insecure at the time too as a kid. Sorry, did you go to this lady's house or was it to John? No, Lennon's I went house? to I went to the to Grattan. Grattan Puxon is now the um, the president of the World Gypsy Council, and he was uh, he did a lot for the travellers of Ireland back in the in the in the late fifties, early sixties. And I played a gig in the Gaiety Theatre. I was about 14 then. And it was kind of an awareness thing, you know. And this is how I knew Grattan and his wife. But she was going to introduce you to John Lennon. Uh, yeah, she had to go down and introduce the pipes, the Irish pipes, to John and, and Paul in the studio. Did you actually get to do that? No, I didn't do it. I you, ran you away. Left. I ran away the next morning. I Why was an that? idiot. Why, why did you run away? I reckon, you know, I was 18, 19, I'd say. I don't know when that album came out. I was around the White Album, as I said. I think I would have been 18, 19 years old. And I was very insecure. And being a young lad, and my saviour was, like, I, I went to, when I did go to London, most people were going on the, 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 the construction route. And I took a wild right turn and ended up in hippie land, which suited me fine coming from the old traveller world. My dad was a traveller, by the way. And, um, what was it, hippie land b- like back then, as oh you God, call it? God, man, it was unbelievable. And I loved it. In the I late fitted 60s? In, it fitted in perfectly. And, you know, I, well, I left school at 14, and all these kids around me were uni dropouts, and, and some of them, anyway, not all. But uh, all kids were sleeping in Hyde Park, running away from home to get into the hippie world. and It was all a huge, we can call it the love decade, like, you know, everybody was uh, wanting to be part of it. And uh, we, uh, we, we were, like, living in communes. And, but, uh, can I ask then, how did you find your way back to the pipes? Oh, that's later. I, I went back to the, hip, to, the, to, the, to the hippie commune, which was a very famous commune in London, 144 Piccadilly. You can look it up, you'll see it. I, uh, I went back there, and then I continued on busking, of course, with guitar and, and singing. And then maybe a few months later, I came back to Ireland. Just before leaving London to come back to Ireland, I, uh, I got the pipes. The guy came with my pipes, who had had them for best part of three years, two or three years in, in, his, in, his, in, his ba- in his attic or basement or whatever. And uh, I took him out in, in, I don't know if it was James's Park or Hyde Park. And uh, next to all these young hippies and people are dancing around me, like, you know. And all I'm doing is tuning and maybe played a bit of a tune. What year was this? This, was, this would have been 69, coming up to, 60, to 70. When I saw the response from the people, it sort of got me you know, back on the 
the instrument that came back to Ireland then and there was a uh, played my family my dad had a had a group going we used to play every week in, in Slattery Cable Street the Pavies was the name of the group and uh, Liam Weldon was there with us and a few of us and that's when all the musicians like Matt Malloy and the Chieftains and all those people used to come in to the little folk club in Dublin and what was the traditional music scene in Dublin, like at that time, in the early 70s? It was huge. With the, in the early 60s. Early um, 70s at this stage. You no, know, the 70s, like the, the late 60s, well, sometime in the 60s, you had the show band scene, and that sort of took away from the trad scene, if you like, because people who used to go to Cayley's and Barnes and all that sort of thing, they all started going to the, what, what was it called, the, the show band uh, scene at the time. But when you move back to Ireland around the early 70s and you were playing in the Dublin scene then what was it like back then? It was great but I'd been playing all through the 60s on and off right. I mean I'd come back and play mm-hmm. with the family so we played places like the, the Swamp Folk Clubs and other like pubs, clubs I was just back from London at Long here and this young lad is sitting in front I'm with my dad in the group you know and Liam and this young lad in the front is going Oh Jesus! Well, you hear your man on the squealy things. So the bleeding cats. Well, and I'm sitting up there like I'm so embarrassed as a young lad. And yeah, I suppose something things like that kind of uh, would uh, would have put me off, you know. Mm. Otherwise, I may have, you know, gone down and met the other lad, and that would have been a great thing to meet these people. Not just whether it would have done any good for my career or not, it wouldn't matter. But they mm. would have used it. Yeah. What musical values? Did your father pass on to you? I suppose he he had a very unique style of playing. I hate the word style because th- this was a, they say style anyway, it's, let's say a traveller style. And the old greats like Johnny Dore and Cassius and Piping this is. And of course, the travellers held on to the Irish culture, a lot of it anyway, during the Troubles and after the Troubles, you know, where the Irish were beaten out of the the Irish, and uh, they couldn't be settled in schools, so they held on to a lot more of the, the old traditions and storytelling, singing, and playing music. Right? Mm. So um, they, had, they had a very unusual style as well. If you take two people, say one from the feather bed and the silver spoon and the other one from a tent, you're going to have a difference in mood, mm. and way in life and, you know, experience of travel, or whatever, you know. It's mm. going to be very, very different. But so the styles were different, or the, um, and good. when you started recording in the mid 70s, you released an album, first of all, and your brother was on it. That's 74. I think. 74. Yeah. Can you tell me about how that recording came about and the recording? It was yeah. just called Paddy Keenan. That's true. Yeah. I, went to, I, went, I, was, I went to a place, Peter Brown, with a band called 1691. Um, and most of the Botley band were in that, actually. Uh, Matt Malloy, Tommy Peoples, Trina, Liam Weldon, and Peter Brown, I think, was with them at the time. And I went to replace him. He was he was uh, he was working otherwise he couldn't make this particular tour or gigs. And I I went over in 1972, and uh, I didn't ever got to play with him actually, although I'd refused joining the band back. But um, I went over anyway, and I met up with Michal O'Donnell and McHanley, and they had a duo going called Monroe and uh, they asked me along to join them on the month's tour they'd organised and I went with them and and stayed with them and then when I got back to Ireland I played a lot more with, with Michal and his sister Trina and Paddy Lacken and from there I could grew to the bossy band with Matt and Donald and the rest of them And could you hear something special when that group played together? I, I loved the singing from Michal and uh, and Mick and all I was doing was like filling in with a bit of trad and maybe I'd play the odd song with them you know I knew the song or if we practiced it or whatever but it was it was it was um, but sure it was a whole new world for me being in Brittany and I was 22 year old and, and uh, all I was used to was playing in Dublin and little part of the country really You mentioned Brittany there? That's where we met yeah, that's where we, that's where I went to fill in for um for for Peter, I see, and this is where I met up with Michal, Triana, and uh, and uh, Mick Hanley. So when the Bahi band started to come together, what are your thoughts when you think back to that time? 
I'm not sure. So far back. But, uh, no, I really enjoyed. I, I enjoyed being with the people. I enjoyed traveling. But back then, man, I, I was I was a bit of an oddball, really. You know, I, I, I wasn't a very happy lad because I'm mixing and I'm in a van all day traveling with all these uni people, and I'm 14, 14 years old out of school. You know, I'm well at the time when I left school. And then the traveller thing would come into it as well, and that was a bit of a block as well for me, you know. And I didn't want that. I was hiding that, you know, which is ridiculous nowadays, but this is what I was doing. And um, so they loved it. I mean, they would never have only loved me more to know. But I tried, and then I was very quiet. I was, I was, it's hard to believe I'm yapping away here. But, but and, and then there was the, the, the dyslexia as well. I had that as well with... Uh, writing so if I went to write something I was half afraid to write in case it get letters in front of where they shouldn't be and all that sort of thing and I wasn't terribly happy but I mean the red carpet was laid out for me with this band and then I thought I suppose we didn't really see it some of us either because we were traveling around on limos we were having we were like living a rock band life at the time really but you were you were with the band for maybe four or five years. That's and a bit you, short, yeah, yeah. But you were ex- but you were expressing all this through the pipes. I mean, when we I listen say, to you play, mm. there's precision, there's power, there's mm, invention. Mm, mm. Is that, do you feel you were yeah. expressing something through your pipes? Well, that's what you asked earlier on, and what I, what I answered was that uh, this is probably why, you know, I played the way I did and, and, and learned to use the music to talk rather than having to express myself verbally, you know. It was it was a weird time for me, but at the same time, I'm not don't want to sound like I'm complaining because I had a wonderful time at times. But then we were playing with people like you know sharing the stage with people like the Kinks and Golden Earrings and rock venues where other bands, traditional bands, weren't uh, asked to play. And what were your ambitions at the time musically? Like the Bahi Band today is known as a very innovative band. You did lots mm. and lots of new arrangements, new approaches. Yeah. Um, it was exciting, it was fast. Were you conscious <coughs> of that or were you just playing what you normally played? I was getting a little bored, actually, to be honest with you, because, you know, I was, I was there with... I had music, you know, and Matt Malai, so did... Uh, if it was Tommy Peoples or if it was Kevin or Paddy... And we had the music side of it. And, you know, I, I was wondering why, you know, there were three other guys, like Michal, Trina and Donald, who had, especially Donald, who had experience of, and, and the lads, you know, with uh, Michal and Trina, with uh, Scarabray and, and Donald, with all those other bands. And I thought, they should be writing lyrics. And we can toss the music around. And let's create something different, you know. And we actually tried it once in, in Paris, a live, it was live in Paris, and we had a... I remember Matt standing there with his with, with his flute, and every time the drum, you know, the the the, the drum kit would hit, <laughs> we weren't used to it, of course, and we still have those recordings that are locked away. <laughs> but um, no, we did, and I, I was always asking myself and Michal actually were the ones that would, you know, we were. T- we, I remember calling up to Donald one night, and we shared a bottle of vodka or whiskey or something like that, and all chat about you know something new. And then I think they also saw me as uh, it, it was kind of eating at me in a way. I was like born in the candle on both ends, and and, it, and they were all drinkers and happy drinkers and partying and and wouldn't say very happy because we weren't making what we should have been making and going where we should have been going. But and in the end, then we took a break, and the break has lasted to the day. We never really officially split. But in the four decades since. The Bahi Band recordings, and I know you've done so much other stuff, but just for that, to stay in that period for a moment, mm. the four decades since, have you been surprised at the influence those recordings have had? People must ask you about them quite regularly. Very much. Yeah, very much. I I spent twenty eight years in the states from ninety two, and uh, our kids come to me, like young kids come up, and they'll talk about the Bahi Band, and they're getting it from their parents, of course, and they have the CDs or whatever they are at the moment. And I'm amazed, yeah. The pipes have gotten me, say, from from here to four continents and around the world, really, to places like the Rainforest and Borneo and Timbuktu and, and around Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, back here, Russia. 
And there's people there who talk about the boss event. We should be we should be millionaires, man. <laughs> and, Someone's rich, woman. And was it the case that the contracts you signed? Oh, it was it was it was ludicrous. We we had a we had a, a an agent come to us once, and I think he was looking after Jethro Tull. He may have been, and other a couple of famous bands, and he uh, he came to us offering to manage us, and we were playing the Rainbow in London. He said, "You'll drop all that. I'm going to fly you across the states on the news." And then tour you. And he says, all you've ever had, he said, is petty thieves. He said, but I want 25% of everything. Your company, the whole lot. We had a record company at the time, Mulligan. And we should have gone. But we were too, I suppose, know, some of the lads, oh, we don't want to be dressed up in suits and doing the cabaret acts and this, that, and that. It was stupid of us, really. We should have gone. If we'd done that, we'd have been better off. Than, well, we'd have been pretty well off today. And I know money's not everything, but... We deserved it. We, 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 we put a lot into it. And that's, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the, the amount of work that Donald would put into arrangements and stuff. And as he said to me once, it's not what I arrange, it's the way you play it or interpret it, whatever. But he was, a, he was an amazing person, himself and Michal and Triana. The whole backing system got us into what I said before, like playing in rock venues and the Pink Pop Festival, places like that, we wouldn't have gotten to if we were just playing straight trad, you know. And would he come Definitely. to band rehearsal with uh, an arrangement in mind or would you sort of just jam it together? We'd, we'd give the tunes, myself, Matt, and uh, whoever the fiddle player was at the time. And uh, Donald would uh, work on arrangements and he'd come back. And some of us would, uh, might be arrangements changed somewhat, or, but very little because whatever Donald came up with, was uh, it was magic really himself and me all and and then the tri- and it was the whole backing system. I mean with Trey and me all Donal, and then we we held on to the roots, and with arrangements we uh, brought the roots around the world. Really, your particular piping also had a big influence on the generations that were to come. There is a there is there, there are quite a few pipes I know that uh, are respond. My my dad actually would be responsible for um, directly or indirectly for some pipers like there are pipers out there that played you know when I'd be away Davy I would give him the job playing with my family and my dad was pretty strict in his ways you know if he wanted to hear what he wanted to hear and if he did something wrong he'd let you know straight away there was no but then and the same the same with Finbar actually Finbar lived with us for, for, for quite some time Finbar Fury in Valley Farm, that's when we lived there, and he only lived a few hundred yards down the street, down the road. But he he lived with us actually as a sibling there enough for a couple of years, and we played quite a bit together. And uh, I'm sure he got something from there as well. But it's like, and then Martin Nolan, who's one of the few that will come up and say he got everything he knows from my dad, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, but have you taught taught the pipes as well? I've given lessons and stuff, but I mean, I wouldn't consider myself, I wouldn't go out to, I think it's people listening and hear and like what they hear and they, they follow that, you know. And then years ago, people would have thought, I think, I was in Sweden years back in the early, seven, mid-70s, and you'd see all these kids going around with fiddles on their backs, you know, and they'd be hiding themselves going into the pub back then because, but they'd be going around there and they'd play a tune and it'd be a, a rip-off of Tommy Peoples, like, and Tommy was the star of it. He always was and always will be. But at the time, they were listening and they'd be playing. If I can play like that record, like that guy plays on that record, I have to be good. So there was a lot of that, you know, the copying. And, and what would your <clears throat> advice be to a young piper? I think it's, we all get from each other. And I think the more you can get and take from another instrumentalist, no matter whether it be pipes or what, to incorporate that into your own style... But not to try to be the other person, that doesn't work. And especially if the person, as I said earlier on, is expressing his mood through music or her mood through music, you can't practice a mood and you, you can't do it. It's not possible. So you can do everything and anything they do. And I know pipers, a couple of pipers who play and do all the stuff I do, but it's like they're disconnected. There's no connection between them and the actual instrument. There's no soul or heart there, depth or whatever, you know. And how do you... How do you put, get that into your music? Because I play it myself. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good question. I've, I never really thought about it, but I think it's... Um, 
I could be playing a tune for you now, and I might be thinking about 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and that's in the tune. You know, it's, and it's particularly if it's slow laments and stuff like that, you find yourself dreaming back. Or it could be present, but mostly it's, it's what you've gone through. And as I said earlier on, there's going to be a huge difference between the privileged and the, and the, and the you can call it a tramp or the, the one who lives under the bridge or the traveller or whatever it may be. There's going to be a difference in their, in their life, you know, in the, the mm. life they've lived. And that's going to come out in the music if they use it for that reason, you know. Yeah. You mentioned mood a couple of times. Mm. So you're trying to create a particular mood when you're performing. Is that what you mean? No, I don't try to create. I, I just live what I've, what I've, you know, my past, my whatever it is. Okay. So or even that moment, it could be it, you know. So it's your mood mm. when you're playing. It's why, it's inter- it's why it keeps an interest in the music for me. Otherwise, I'd be bored. Man, if I had to play a tune the same way twice, even twice, I reckon I'd be terribly bored with it. And I play other instruments as well, you know, so it keeps me... Uh, if I, were to, I don't play the pipes at home much at all. I play maybe guitar, sax, mandolin, banjo, stuff like that. And I don't listen to a lot of Irish music. Because when I was in London at the time, at that time, I was uh, there was a lot of blues and, and uh, other music. So. There were moments today in the concert, particularly the Blarney Pilgrim, hmm. when there was a, an extraordinary range of invention. You were doing mm-hmm. lots of different things with it. Mm-hmm. At moments like that, are you thinking about it? No. Is it something you've done before? Or? Well, some of it, but a lot of it isn't. A lot of it, I, honestly, I, I, I could make a mistake because I, I don't know sometimes what I'm doing next. And it's a huge problem if I lift the mandolin or the banjo because I want to do what I... The, I want to feel and be able to do what I can do on the pipes or the other instrument that I'm used to. And I get fed up and leave it there, not realising it takes practice, you know, but you can't just instantly do stuff like that. But with the pipes, all the time, it's, um, it's, it's, it's surprising myself a lot. Really? I, honestly, it, 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 I could very easily get scattered by it, you know, but if it does once, it won't happen the second time. Yeah. Is it part of it that you like taking the risk yeah. in the moment? Mm. Someone described it as... Um, Free falling, once it was another piper actually, that my style of playing was free falling. I don't know how you would explain that. It's just, it's just anything. You know, my fingers can do something <laughs> that I'm not aware of. Sometimes it, 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 it's like that. I'm not saying that I'm not. You know, that it's not happening. Something is, but it's so instant, instant, and it, 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 uh, it surprises myself sometimes. You've lived in the states. Mm. for quite a while. Did you play a lot when you were in the States? I did, an awful lot, actually. When I went to the States in 92, I hadn't got a great reputation, to be honest, because I don't think people would be, be wondering, I suppose, if they implied me, would I be, you know, because I was drinking a lot, partying a lot, and uh, living the lifestyle of something else altogether. And, and uh I could come in. I'd, I'd never failed on a gig, though. I mean, I may not be as as uh, in control of the instrument, maybe. Or I would just play them and I wouldn't, you know, I'd, I'd push them into tune and make my own reads so I can somewhat do that. But um, when I went to the States then, I kind of saved, I would say it there, I've saved my life, the way I was, you know, carrying on. And I was 42 then. Uh, I tried several times to... Uh, to get off the booze and live differently. Gave up music and had a little uh, antique shop in West Cork where I did courses and you know went into restoring old antiques and buying and selling and all that sort of thing. But um, yeah, I did done really well with that. But then I was offered a trip to L.A. to meet up with Linda Ronstadt, Amy Lou Harris and Dolly Parton. And uh, I went there and Jesus, man, that was some disaster really for me. I... I was off drinking when I should have been in the studio and partying, you know. And I kind of blew that in a way. It's, uh, oh, and did they want you to play on an album with mm, them? Mm, well, they were doing a song of three on us, uh, Linda. And the, the story, or the excuse I heard afterwards, was that she couldn't or didn't do it because she discovered with this song, she had a bit, supposedly had a slight lisp and it was prominent in the song and she gave up on it because of that. But she did start recording again 
you recorded Na Keen Affair in 1997. Did, uh, that was a bit of a disaster too. <laughs> Although it was, the, it, 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 it was the, it was the, what would you call it? It was the most successful in sales of any album. It's weird. You know, well, there's great playing on it. Well, it was production. You know, produce, what happened was, the thing was mixed. It was, and I had some of the greatest musicians like Artie Midlane and Tommy O'Sullivan, Matt Mal- or Tommy Peoples and Niall Vallely and all. But what, it, what happened was, the guy had gotten a new, a new piece of equipment, and this is back when someone would call you up and say, I'm bam, well, you see it now, I've got eight gigabytes, or, you know, eight, eight megabytes, you know. And it was massive at the time. That was 92 or 93 or 4 or something like that. But then you got this bit of equipment. This was 97 when this happened. 96 maybe. And uh, it was a compressor. And fucking they went through a compressor. The mix under that. And we'd lost the original mix. So I'm in, I'm in, uh, in Boston driving around and I was going to throw it into the the river there. <laughs> really? Yeah, and I'm thinking, what am I going to call this thing, you know, because I knew I was going to be hit. For the and actual fact, I played around with the word effed up. Were you, ki- were you thinking of just abandoning the album altogether? No, no, I was, I was, I was, uh, the, the whole thing turned out, as I said, the way it did with, it, with, with the compressor and stuff as a bad, a bad production or overproduced or whatever they called it at the time. You weren't happy with Knocking Affair, but can no. you look back at it now? I mean, it's 23 years ago. Can you look back at it now and I think appreciate I'm, it? No, not really, because I still have it on multitrack and I many, many times wanted to remix it. But the, the, the tune, Johnny's tune, which is also not, you know, it just, it just came about. And you don't record something as soon as it comes out. You must play it to It becomes more related to the cause, you know, or what you've written it for or whatever. But, Oh, that was that wasn't as I wanted, but that's the actual tune that sold so many of those CDs. The album, the album that sold the most. It sold the most, but that's one Johnny's tune so helped sell the most. You know, sell it, so they say. And I think the tunes were there was, there was a good selection of tunes, and there were tunes were played well. But it was like when the great musicians I had with me. Mm. But the fact that it had gone through that piece of machinery was a was a. The downfall of it, really, in a way. And are you planning any more recordings at the moment? I have one on my computer for the last. I, but I don't know how I'm living off it because I, I have every twenty years. <laughs> the last one was oh, oh, was it what, oh way oh two, and then there was one with the Japanese lad there a few years back, mm. and I have one on my uh, on my computer like a mix of live and other musicians and an actual fact one of them is with uh, Steve Morse. From the purple, we were asked to do something to create awareness. The Navajos over in the west coast of America, and we, we put something together. There's a, there's a bit of a mix, you know, from live to studio to dating back to 92. But it's an album there, if I want it. But I'm thinking twice about letting it out, because I might do something else and just put it in with the package and have it double. And mm. you mentioned on stage earlier on that you don't do many concerts these days no I, I haven't in a while in a long time I did a few gigs there over the last three years with um, with Frankie and Dermot the, the trio which came out as the KGB because of Keenan, and uh, Gavin Byrne or whatever we did a few gigs over the last three years with those and I've, I have travelled a bit like since then uh, maybe a few things in France or Russia or uh, the States and stuff like that. Do you enjoy the Europe. concerts? I do when everything's right. I enjoyed the gig today. Really did. When it's relaxed like that, and uh, and I was kind of worried about it today because I hadn't played for a while and I hadn't played with uh, Gary for, for quite a long time. But when it, when you get the right audience, the audience is half the gig, really, I think. you know, If, it's, if the audience are listening and, uh, you know, the disrespect going on there, it, it makes it so much more relaxing, much more easier to uh, deliver. And what did it mean to you when you received the T.G. Cahar Gratham Cole Musician of the Year Award? I was amazed. But, and I was in the States and uh, I think I was nominated at the time and then I got word that I'd, I'd gotten it. And when I came back, I don't know, many people wouldn't know this. I had a daughter that I didn't see at birth. She was adopted from at birth. And it was all in secret because of the fact the 
good old Catholic Ireland at the time. And um, we couldn't get married, so the, the child was uh, born in secret and handed away, and, and uh, I didn't see her until she was 26. And on that very night that I was coming out to accept that award, I got a call in the back room, and I had everything tied, you know, trying to work out what I was going to say, and blah, 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 and thanking the people and all that. And uh, I got a call from her boyfriend, who had seen me on the late late, and uh, uh, asked, and I said, yeah, we'll meet, and we'll meet in Dublin. I hope I didn't get you the bad time. <laughs> so I came out, and I was speechless. I couldn't say a word, and I'm out there. And even on the on the band, when the, the Vati band came about to play, Michal said to me, we'll start on eight, you know, the count of eight. And I counted, I started on the count of seven. I was so... And then when I went up to accept the thing, I, I, I just pointed up, I said, thanks to my mum up there. I couldn't, I couldn't, I just, I was completely shocked from, you know, I was delighted, don't mm. get me wrong, but I, I didn't know what, my head just, you know. And, uh, and then they gave me this piece, which was a one-off piece. And uh, it's a pipe around a, and a piece of marble, bronze or whatever. And sometime later, I gave it away to the, to the to the travelers here in at the Black Box Theatre, we did a gig, and I handed it up as a perpetual sort of gift to encourage young kids back in, or into second and third level education. That kind of thing. Traveler culture is that something that is very important to your identity? It is now. Back then, it was a, it was a well, put it it was it was. Um, I don't know. It's 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 how we were treated back then. I mean, if you go to school, and I have a friend who's who's uh, they call him Big Black Joe. He's about six foot three, and he lives down. He was born in Feathers in the county in South Tipperary, and we met up, and it was kind of similar to his stories going to school. He was saying, if he wasn't a big lad, he's six foot three you now. If he wasn't a big lad, he could have been, you know, he'd have been bullied and beaten and you know slagged and racism and all that sort of shit. And when I was at school, it was pretty similar, you know. Because when we moved into the house in 56, we had, uh, my dad took the mayor and the four-wheeler with him. It's the only transport and way of work he had. And there were no cars and no money in Ballyfermot back then. And anyway, it was all the poor of the country were thrown in there. But the social world was better because we none of us had anything. But uh, we were something, and a few other travellers that moved in, even though my mother wasn't. She came from a respectable family in the cabin. Respectable, sorry, from a settled family. Mm -hmm. And um, they they found something I realized. I believe now, in hindsight, that they could look down on. They needed something, because they had nothing, you know. They were selling crab apples across the road from us, out through the window, making enough for a loaf of bread or whatever. And my dad would be making more, because he'd be taking all the rubbish they were throwing out, which was cotton, glass, all this recycling copper, brass, scrap, all that. I need to give me, you know, tinsel stuff, like Hector Gray stuff, really. I don't know if you'd ever remember Hector Gray. Mm -hmm. yes. The one who started all that stuff. But they, they would make a living from what they were throwing out. And then the, the, the settled people saw this, and in actual fact, they, in the end, had horses and cars, and in the end, they wouldn't swap them for cars. Whereas once traveller identity wasn't that important to you, but traveller culture is very important to you now? Well, it is, of course. And you know what? And as I said earlier on about being with the uni and all that, share around me and, and, and thinking, feeling inadequate and inferior and all that sort of thing because of education, because of this, because of being a traveller, whatever. Those people would have, they loved me for it. I didn't realise that. You know? It's so different. I remember Michal saying to me once, you know, we really envy, I really envy your, 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 your um, ability to be, to remain quiet. Sure, I was, I was holding my symbol because behind a mask, like, he didn't realise that, that it was a part of my sickness, really, you know. Mm. But, um, no, it was my, it was my own doom, but it just came, obviously came from a, from a, a part of my life that, uh, not through me or through my family, but through, you know, a lot of the, did a class, if you like. But it was, it, in, in, in hindsight, now it was a valuable and a beautiful part of my life. And I don't think I'd be the musician today if I wasn't a traveller. So you've been on this incredible journey as a musician. Over the past. A wonderful time. The music has got me. And, it, and one travel is one of the greatest educations, really, because you're seeing everything firsthand. 
And as my dad said to me once, he said, I have nothing much to give you but music, but you'll never starve if you have to, you know, sit on the side of the road. And not only that, he said, but it'll, it'll cross every language, you know, it'll every break every language barrier, so, and it did. Thanks for listening to the Journal of Music podcast. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or follow us on SoundCloud. This episode was presented by Toner Quinn and produced by Shannon McNamee. Thank you to Flirt FM at the National University of Ireland in Galway, where these podcasts are recorded. For more on the Journal of Music, visit journalofmusic.com.